Hello and welcome to our, our presentation today uh, from Tim Flack. Uh, you're all more than welcome to this presentation. It's the first one that we have organized for 2024. Uh, and I hope you enjoy it. Before, before we start, before anything happens, um, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Ricardo Busi, who is our president of FIAB. And I know he has some words of welcome uh, to give to us. Uh, so Ricardo, I pass the microphone over to you. Uh, and don't forget, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Paul. So, uh, dear photographer friends, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation in this uh, very special edition of the Fiat Photo Academy. It's uh, a great pleasure that uh, we welcome today one of the biggest names in world photography, Tim Flack. He is indeed a renowned photographer known uh, for his uh, captivating uh, and uh, sliced animal portrait. His uh, work often goes uh, beyond the traditional wildlife photography by focusing on the emotional and aesthetic aspect of animals. Tim uh, has uh, dedicated a significant part of his career to documenting uh, biodiversity and raising awareness about endangered species. But uh, I leave the pleasure of introducing <laughs> such a famous guest uh, to my friend uh, Paul Staley. From uh, my side, I can only say that uh, I'm really very happy that uh, we are finally able to have him with us today in our meeting. Not only because uh, he's a dear friend of mine, but also because he's a very special person. Thank you, Tim, on my behalf, on behalf of the International Federation of Photographic Art, uh, board directors, and on behalf of the FIAP friends uh, from different countries uh, across five continents uh, who decided to participate uh, in our event today. I wish you, dear friend, a great success with your presentation. I also would like to welcome the president of the Photographic Society of America, and my special friend, J.R. Schnelzo. And uh, as I told you before, I will now have the pleasure of handing the microphone over to my friend, uh, Paul Staley, the director of the Fiat Photo Academy Online Events, we we'll introduce our special guest in more detail. Well, dear friends, thank you again for your participation and looking forward to meeting you all soon again. I wish you a very nice light and enjoy our event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you to you. So I say welcome to everybody to Creating Empathy Through Animal Portraiture with Tim Flack. Uh, for those people who do not know, uh, as 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 um, Ricardo was saying there, Tim is a photographer known for his stylized animal portraits, and he's dedicated his career to documenting biodiversity and conveying a sense of empathy towards our planet's endangered creatures. He's based in London, though I think he travels the world and he was explaining to us earlier on about some fantastic places he's been to and some wonderful exhibitions of his work that, that he's had in those places. During his presentation today, he's going to discuss his work and he's going to do it in, particularly in the context of what depictions of animals can most powerfully connect us with them and can evoke empathy. Um, he has, He's very well qualified. I mean, he's got a doctorate from the University of Arts, London. He's an honorary fellow of the Royal Photographic Society. He is president of the Association of Photographers and is an artist in residence at Linacre College in Oxford. So um, we're really, really pleased and really thrilled to have him here with us today. Uh, before I hand over to Tim, just to remind everybody that um, we will take questions. And, and Tim is very happy to take questions, even as he goes through his presentation. Um, so if you have any questions, please send them to me in the chat facility, uh, or if you, if you want to, please unmute yourself and interrupt, uh, and, and, and we can ask the question then at that stage of Tim. 
So that's it. I'm going to stop speaking now and I'm going to say a very, very big welcome to Tim. And uh, the floor is yours now, Tim. Well, Paul and Ricardo, thank you for the, the very kind words from you both. Um, first of all, before I actually get in my presentation, I'm, I'm in my cellar, as, as Paul mentioned, in London, Shoreditch. And uh, I'm in the midst of a book on, called Feline. And um, in, my, in my whole my studio, I'm just going to swing things around to give you an idea. These are magnetic boards putting out about 50% of my book. And then we can see all the different kind of processes of us trying to I can angle this back to front uh, on the board. Um, but I just thought I'd sort of give you a, a context. My studio's on two levels here. But before I go on, I'm going to uh, share my, my screen and let's see if this all does behave itself. Um, bear with me. Right, excellent. I hope you see some parrots there. We do indeed, Tim. Perfect. That's, a, that's excellent. Thank you. So first of all, I wanted to give you some context. My, my background is I, I came from some advertising photography and progressively uh, being more involved with galleries and also public engagement. And um, for photographers today, we often have to wear many hats. And for, for me, I, I find myself both engaging with the, the questions around the natural world, but also perceptual questions. So this is just but some behind shots to show this is a museum in, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, but my work, this is the Naturalist Museum Paris, for example. This is actually Baden, we're just speaking to someone who's from Austria. Um, uh, this is um, uh, a big exhibition that I think had two million visitors in China. Um, and I've got concurrent museum shows happening both in the States, Spain, um, France, um, and, and, and various other countries. So my, my work's about telling stories and I'm going to look at how images work and some of the ideas around perception which fascinate me so a lot of my images are about telling stories and the, encouraging people to connect with the character and personality of, of animals this is um part of henna in columbia and so really i see work a lot of my work involves and this is uh, obviously working with the Royal Foundation, Prince William, and, and many different parties around the world. Um, these, my, my books form, in a sense, my main bodies of work. So I'm currently working on feline, and um, in 2021, I, I bought out birds. They tried to tell the relationship between both been in, in science and sociological aspects uh, about the natural world. So this is now back to the other side of the door. And uh, this is a, a natural duck and I'm doing a small set here. But I wanted to show you literally, um, you know, the, the kind of work practice. I must say, I, just before I meant to say at the beginning that I don't think I've ever had a Zoom call where I'm actually um, presenting to five continents and many countries. So it is a rather unique experience. Um, but this is from the birds, but this is just to give a sense of the kind of structure and the way I set things up. So this is um, building a, a larger water set than the small one I had in my studio. I wanted to achieve almost painterly qualities to the reflection of the birds And sometimes what I'm after is to actually give, make nature personal. This is behind the scenes at the uh, sea life. It was one of the few shots during the pandemic where it actually was an advantage that the, it, was, it was close to the public and I could actually uh, take these Gento penguins and be able to freeze them using high speed flash. Sometimes the locations of my animals are not always, as you might imagine, sort of very controlled. This is the uh, island in someone's kitchen, and these are actually Jacobean pigeons. And one of the things I'm fascinated by is the way that 
we, we kind of project upon animals. So for example, these Jacobean um, pigeons were, were apparently um, one of the, for Charles Darwin, he, he, he was a pigeon fancier. And these were critical in his theory about how, as an a analogy, how if we could shape animals, then that could be an analogy of what happened in the wild. But they almost look like fashion easers. You get this sense of, 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 of a kind of slightly shifted reality. To give you some idea, I built specially designed aviaries. This allowed me to get very up close to animals, presenting again this kind of character and personality. So we would have everything through this neoprene aperture, the birds would feel less stressed and would allow a kind of more connection to the animal. When I'm working with imagery, I'm very interested in this idea of ambiguity, not just in terms of confusion, but different layers of meaning. So we look at a bird here, and from, from, from someone in America, it has a different meaning maybe to over here. Maybe we think of the robin in the winter. But then you think of angry birds, and you're kind of transported to another kind of association that's quite often working subliminally. And as photographers, we have to kind of take an interest in the potentiality of the meaning of imagery. This is a golden finch from Australia. I thought this one looked a bit like a, a pilot from the First World War, but someone said when I posted it on Instagram, it looked like more like Elvis Presley. Um, the Toka Toucan, and this, this, this uh, rather smart, sporting uh, a moustache is an Inca term. And again, it's this thing about character and personality. But in fact, for the birds, the bigger the moustache you're sporting, the more food you've got and the more uh, attractive you are as a mate. So it definitely means you're sexier with a big moustache. This is the Inca term from, from Peru. Philippine eagle, one of the rarest um, birds of prey in the world um, from the Philippines. So this is um, the, all related to my bird book. So some of my work has related, is being connected to commissions. So we got a peregrine falcon here, and this is something that was commissioned for stamps, but I also used in my book. I've done quite a few sets of stamps and have been using my, well, I don't send so many letters now, but I always have my own stamps essentially to send the mail out on. Some of my campaigns will be familiar, but they won't necessarily be associated with my name. So for example, this campaign for iPhone uh, was the first time that they used imagery. And the idea was these small beta fish would become quite abstract. And this was, um, and they continued this to this day. To give some background to the set building, here, here is a, um, Here's a set for Whiskers Cat Food. We're building two sets. One is a bathroom set and one is a sitting room set. The concept is that every cat has a, has a kind of bigger cat wanting to get out. And actually that's based on actual um, evidence of what people name their cat, you know, Leo and Tiger. And so here we're, we're, we're building now the kitchen set. I just wanted to show some back behind the scenes, show the way I operate. So for here, we're doing the big cat. Who's just stand in there? In fact, this, I believe this went quite viral as, a, as an advertising campaign on social platforms. And there are many different permutations of people using the image and putting their own cat in there. So some of the campaigns I've done involved, this is for the Sunday Times. Um, in fact, um, Richard Branson and Elton John, who obviously featured here, they both use these images on their social platforms and asked for 
feedback and, and bubbles as to what to put there for captions. Uh, so I'm glad that they weren't offended by it. This is New York. So this really comes back to now my body's at work. So I'm fascinated on how we construct imagery and a lot of uh, contemporary thought is, has in a sense established the idea that a lot of what we do is we project more than we in a sense receive sensory signals. So the bat is, 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 is obviously a loaded subject. You look here at, you know, you have good bat, um, uh, Batman putting the fear of God into the criminal world. You have, have Bat, uh, Dracula, the blood-sucking vampire. But interesting enough, you also have Nagel's, you know, how does it think like a bat? And this idea of perception. And I'm fascinated in how do we, in a sense, build or construct imagery. So these images here you're seeing are essentially turned the wrong way up. But because we're used to or we predict and anticipate that the eye should be above the feet, it allows us to engage with them in a much more human way, a more anthropomorphic way. And I've been always quite interested in this relationship between how we, as I say, bring meaning to images. So for example, this bat could be giving this other bat a hard day. It's kind of, it's very easy to now they're this way up to project upon them very much more human qualities. They almost have fingers like us. Linnaeus, the taxonomist, um, originally said that um, placed the bats and the primates and humans all in the same group because the skeletons looked so similar or there were such similarities. Um, now we know that they're more related to with DNA uh, testing or geno, we know that they're more uh, related to vermin. So this, the idea of symbolism is part of my work. So we have here a dove, but genetically very similar to a rock dove, which is no different to the feral pigeons. So it's something that is the symbol of peace and uh, the Holy Spirit and has many, many different um, cultural significance um, is no different to what our mayor once described as flying rats outside. This idea that actually colour in this case does matter. So one of my first books I did uh, was on horses and here we're behind the scenes I'm photographing a, a world champion show horse called, they refer them as halter horse, from Ajman in the UAE looking out of a window into the desert by using flash, I'm able to create a sense of ambiguity of space. The frame of the window from the inside to stable becomes like a frame and the, in, in, and the desert becomes part of the painting in the picture. And there's a, there's a famous uh, equine photog painter called George Stubbs, who did a painting of a chestnut like this with an eye but against a similar color background, not, not the desert, that mimics that. So in the subconscious level, I'm assuming that there's a slippage, but not one that necessarily everyone can get, but they do get it subliminally. And this is really how I, I work my images. So for example, look at this horse. If you don't keep horses, you might think I'm into a bit kind of fetish or something, or something strange. But if you keep horses, you know in, like the desert, you need um, the head protector to keep the flies off. Or for example, this horse could be going to a boxing ring rather than it's a head protector to, to stop it bashing its head when it's recovering or coming round from full anaesthetic. Some of my work explores this question of, of how much of an image do you show for it to be understood for what it is and how much allows a poetic space, a space that allows perhaps to reflect on your winter holiday, skiing holiday. I call this horse mountain, but I love this idea. You show more horse, it becomes less poetic. Show not enough horse, you don't know what you're looking at. And that means you have to be interested in how people imagine 
pictures and in a sense make them become something in the, how it form how we understand and read images as a communicator we have to be intrigued on how pictures work i believe this is behind the scenes from my first book equus um, in iceland it's about midnight so it doesn't look like midnight <laughs> but it is in the middle of summer and it's partly linked to the heritage of these Icelandics, which are never allowed to be brought back onto the island once they leave the island. Sometimes images are disturbing. And like the images, I'm often interested in pictures that disrupt and sometimes that give pleasure. And when I ask people on my wall which ones they like, sometimes they like the ones that, are, that, that uh, other people find the most annoying. And the ones that sit in the middle that no one cares about are probably the images to get rid of. Sometimes you need images that challenge you. And here we're looking at a horse. It's almost smiling. It's a horse embryo at day 85. The eyes are almost like imprints on some sort of manufactured toy. And you have this play and it can be disturbing, but I think it's intriguing. The same goes for this featherless chicken, which I didn't pluck. It's called a scaleless chicken. Like a bit like a sphinx cat, it ha has no fur. But then you have this whole question as you look at this prancing chicken, almost on point, like a ballerina, looking back at us in that unerring way. But interesting enough, at a time when we produce trillions, quite literally, of chickens, in fact, some would argue with the Anthropocene, that's the markers of this new, well, the new age we are in, one controlled by man, that chicken bones will be one of the contributors. And, and it's strange is that we, there was a research program done by Tim Colson when he was at Cambridge, he's now Oxford, and they did a paper called Why Should Conservationists Heed Pokemon? And they found that school children uh, could recognize from the hundreds of cars they did of wildlife and Pokemon characters, they could, they could recognize more Pokemon characters in British wildlife. So we're at a time when we've never been more dislocated or separated. And I think one of the challenges is how we connect people to the natural world. And that this kind of image brings into the question that we're most likely to meet a chicken in the supermarket rather than maybe keep hen laying chickens at home. And that this shift of what we call modernity Modernity was quite described as the disappearance of wildlife in humanity's habitat. It's something I'm exploring with companion animals, my next book, that if you could describe modernity as this loss, then what are the changes of the animals and what they're meaning to us? Now, I wanted to touch on an area that fascinates me, and it's part of one area of quite a few I'm into, is how we construct pictures. So left gaze bias means that you look at a picture such as this, and you can't help yourself but want to believe those wrinkled bits are eyes, when in fact they're the back of the ears of, of this pig, Mishan pig. And the same goes for this, the ray. You want to believe those eyes there, which are actually gills, are eyes with a smiling face. So this brings me to the cover of my book from Dogs, which is my second book. And we look at this image of a Hungarian pulley jumping, be it not that familiar. Um, what's interesting is it looks symmetrical. It looks like a triangle. And yet when you flip it, it becomes no, no longer symmetrical. And this is an area that I'm fascinated, which is the tendency to go to one side. Incidentally, the, um, the, the, the head's on the right hand side here. Of the, of what I call flying mob. So I'll give an example. Um, obviously, I can't see you. Sadly, I can't see your faces and present at the same time, which I could. But we look here now at this picture. And I'll give you a bit, a bit of a moment to look at it. And I can predict, although we're not in an audience here, that not many of you found the window in the right top right-hand corner. And that this is predictable, that you can predict how edges work and how areas of interest, and that you will find it, but not immediately. So you can actually anticipate how images are read. In this similar way, for my, also for my book, Dogs Gods, um, 
which came out in 2010, um, we have here a, a Spignoteria, we have the pheasants. But if you look down at the bottom right hand corner, camera right, you'll see another pheasant which has been held down. I literally released these pheasants. They mostly went in the wrong direction. So this is a whole idea of this connect, these, these um, you know, this panther, it's actually a leopard, melanistic leopard. Um, you're reminded of, of your own domestic cat. And I'll actually go on to more cat images later. So here we have a animal which is a picture that's both not familiar, I suspect, other than those that was used for the talk just now. Um, but we're not used to seeing tiger's shake, but we are used to dogs, maybe a golden retriever shaking. And thereby the saliva is leading us around the picture, but there's this slippage between familiarity and, and, and I said, the non-familiar. The crested macaque looking back at us, that whole kind of the gaze, or the texting of, of a capuchin, named after the, the, the monks whose habit was very similar to the capuchin monkey. So I'm dressed up in one of these onesies taking these pictures. And this is part of a reintroduction program for the panda in Wolong outside Chengdu in, in the Sichuan province in China. But I'm also here in Washington State Zoo, in, in National Zoo in Washington, New States. And here we are with a toy panda before we get the real panda on set. I'm there trying to give some guidance to those to help me handle this obviously very important uh, new um, addition to the zoo. And here is the actual, this is a back room in the zoo. And this is for the Smithsonian Magazine cover, which I've been flown over to do. So this is a different panda. This panda that looks like it's doing karaoke um, was actually uh, in Chengdu. And it, again, it's slightly ambiguous. You've got these teeth that looks like human. It looks like it's about to do karaoke. It's very human. And of course, pandas are very cute. And this part of this, I'm fascinated in this relationship of how we bring meaning to images. For example, this looks, this is a um, critically endangered um, Yunnan monkey, which is near the Tibetan Plateau in, in, in China. And, and it is at the highest altitude of any primate. Extreme temperature, hence the funny nose, and what looks like extreme cosmetic surgery. This is the Shafaka, named after the sound it makes. A lima, uh, again, a critically endangered project for my endangered book this time, which came out in 2017. Posed a bit like a child, you know, in an assembly room. And this whole relationship between body language is something that fascinates me. How do we project upon images? For example, here we have a, a set, a, almost a family group, and out with a couple of uh, young, a mother with two youngsters here. But the composition, you'll notice that I move the eye from the bottom left hand corner and around, creating a circular sense of this, of what is based really on classical uh, portraiture. Here we see a moment with bonobos, which are not chimpanzees, they're, they're actually uh, much at court society. But we first look at this picture and we assume what we're seeing is a very tender moment because we have to, in a sense, anthropocentrize. We have to place our own sensibilities and thoughts of, as we as human onto this image. And here we see this very tender moment, but actually it's a dominant gesture of a, 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 a dominant female over a junior. So I'm fascinated by in a sense, this whole concept between construction of our realities. So here we have an image of a subject which is um, it's a, a pie tamarind, not very familiar to many, unless you're a paleontologist, sorry, uh, not paleontologist, uh, if you're a specialist in this area, uh, from um, the 
Manos in the Amazon, it's literally been concreted out to extinction. But if I said Yoda from Star Wars, the scientific character is so much more familiar to us. So we can, in a sense, lose the actual animal whilst having the scientific character, science fiction character or sci-fi in existence. And I think this is a concern really, as we approach a new era of AI and extensions of our kind of realities, that we must be careful that we don't lose touch totally. And that images have an important role in a sense to tell stories and to evoke empathy. This is a project um, I was asked to be part of a program to reintroduce the first bird in human history back into the wild, having become extinct. This is the Sphinx macaw. And on the day of the release of this bird, um, they projected this onto Christ the Redeemer. And it was the last time it had been the Olympic Games. But this particular character was, was um, from Rio, the film. <laughs> And what's interesting is this cross between science fiction, or sorry, filmic, you know, fiction uh, in a cartoon and the reality of the bird. The bird became extinct in the 1980s. It's rather tragic to think that I, I mean, I was very proud to be part of the team, but this is the first in human history, a bird to be reintroduced. And these are a couple, a couple of the images. It's, there are four species of blue macaw, and this is one of the smaller ones they live in quite arid environments. And the project's taken many years to develop, re, 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 get the habitat to a state where you could reintroduce the birds as well. And then the problems of reintroducing cattily bred birds back in. So it was captive, extinct in the wild and it was reintroduced from captive birds back into the wild. This is the OM, a um, critically endangered animal for my endangered project. And it's a lives in total darkness. It's a salamander. The axolotl, I find a fascinating animal. Um, it has, um, I wish I could do this, it grows back part of its own brain, limbs. So it's been studied by medicine. It's um, a symbol in Mexico. They come from Mexico. They're almost extinct. There have been very few found in the wild. Uh, a lot in captive uh, aquariums. They uh, were the symbol for um, Mexican, the Aztecs, sorry, the Aztecs of um, the god Axolotl that took the guys, dying souls to the underworld with the setting sun. So these multiple levels. And on another level, they can choose when to go from juvenile state to adulthood, known as neoteny, and they can choose when that state is best. This is um, a saiga, which is one of the, again, critically endangered animal for, and it's, it's, it's got this almost, it looks like it could be in, in a canteen in Star Wars. And, and you have this proboscis nose, which for the very dusty environments, they can't be kept in zoos. I think this is probably the one, the most stylized images to exist of this image, so of this saiga antelope, and has thereby been used by National Geographic, BBC and by a lot of others as, as, a, as an image for various, various um, publications. Often with my images, although I'm trying to sort of, in a sense, give context, like the landscape in the case of polar bears, but I always want to bring it personal. I want to bring it up front, make the character of the animals. I did research with social scientists. I published a paper and I'm doing a big project in the National Science Foundation involved in looking at how images of animals work to evoke empathy. If you can evoke empathy, you can, it, can of, it will often lead to uh, conservation or pro-environmental outcomes, in other words, to support. It, historically, the environmental movement invested so much in the belief that if you, if you romanticize the natural world, but it became a distant non-human world. And the challenge is to make it relatable, to make it personal. And the research has shown that significantly more empathetic if you can connect, make it connectable, relatable, personal, emphasize character. For example, the, the hippopotamus, by being with it, even down to the fish, 
you get that kind of relatable and you start to think, well, what is that animal thinking? And if you accompany it with the right stories, my books are carefully researched so that I put a lot of time into that. So I want to tell the story, the conservation story. In the case of um, the hippos, they became under pressure because they were seen as an alternative ivy, the teeth, the big teeth. This is Savo National Park, one of the few places where there are big ivory tusks, um, um, where, sorry, where, where, where the um, big tuskers, as they're referred to, still in the world, in Africa. This is the uh, monarch butterfly, an incredible migration from Mexico through generations up through uh, North America, right to the borders of Canada for 2,000 kilometers or more, and then they come back back down uh, to, to, to winter over in Mexico. So this is um, fireflies, a one-hour time exposure uh, done at twilight. And these guys um, literally are flashing and you're seeing the traces. In Japanese, this is Southern Japan, they're often referred to as the dancing souls of their ancestors. So I spoke about this idea of ambiguity. I'm fascinated how we might look at a picture like this and the, the plankton become like celestial stars. And there's almost a dancing quality to these um, sea angels, which are really just jellyfish, but they become almost like cupids in some, in some roof of a celestial <laughs> scene. And it's this play on our references, which I find fascinating. Now I want to move on to a project I'm doing now, which is on cats. And I'm taking certain type of cats to see how they can explore questions about what cats are. You know, they say cats have, you know, dogs have masters and cats have staff. For this idea of the bandit, you know, the, the cat behind, these are real cats. Uh, this is um, from, uh, incredibly, it's actually from Japan, from Kobe. And it does look a bit kawaii. I use the concept of cuteness, you know, fluff ball. Um, and it's this sort of, they almost look unreal. And this is an, um, a cat called Narnia from, from France. It's a British short hair. And here you almost get a picture in a picture. And I took the very close up because I know when the book comes out, that people won't trust the image because it literally is that we don't, it's behind the scenes. For example, I'm going to, in my next book, I'm going to do QR codes with some of the mo less believable images because we know that there's going to be an erosion of trust in images and that we've got to future proof the way images work. So I find it crazy that I have to consider the authenticity of imagery and the way I do it by supporting my book with QR codes that link to videos. But this is what I'm going to do because I realize if I don't do that, when the book still is out in publication in say 2040, because my last book on dogs is now in its 14th edition, I have to think going forward. So I'm halfway through the book. And some of these guys, this is a chimera cat where the embryo fused inside the mother's wound created two split markings. This one's got hypertrichosis. And it's a very long haired cat. It, and they also become these celebrities. And I'm fascinated about the role of companion animals, the role that cats now are three times more ownership in the home as house pets than dogs. Not that there are equal number of cats and dogs in the world. But that what does that mean? How do they fill that gap I said before about the disappearance of wildlife and, and, and the sense how we relate to the natural world. Sometimes I've done images, I'm showing you images no one's seen. I haven't even had, I only shot these a couple of weeks ago. This is the whiskers of a cat when it's chasing a prey from underneath and you actually see the whiskers come in into almost a tulip shape. This is because they are, cats basically have blur vision up to about until about a foot away. And so the whiskers become their way of homing in or showing a cat in a way, almost a, a sphinx cat. So you start seeing the anatomy and forms. I like this idea of telling a story about the animals. For example, the shoulders of cats are on the side and you can see this on the one on the right. Or for example, 
the muscle structure of a cat. This is a sphinx on a treadmill, how it actually starts to tell you something about the anatomy. It reminds me of a picture I did of a greyhound, a championship greyhound, and that it actually takes you and explains something about the cat. This is a new breed that came out, who was only recognized in 2010, called the Lakoi cat, the wolf cat. This will be produced in my book, The Size of a Human Arm, and I'll make it more pinky and more that has that sort of feel. I thought, well, I better do a, a shaking cat, given that I've done a shaking tiger. Uh, be consistent. This is a, a mancoon, a very big cat. And again, this is about breeding chat. We shape these um, orientals, which are basically uh, colored Siamese, to be um, almost which reshape the cats. And also with respect to the, the wild cat species, this will be part of my next book. Apparently, the most common name in the cemeteries for cats, cat cemeteries, is Leo and Tiger. So clearly we don't, we think of our cats as this beast in our home. And so I want to explore the symbolism of the cat. So this is, uh, I believe this is my last image. And um, it is, it is um, also a cat roaring. I've got a long way to go, um, but I've just shown you some images that I've actually never actually, well, the, 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 many of them have not been seen and hence uh, I'm just trying to share with you um, the, 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 the progress of my book. But I think that when we're entering an age of generative AI, i.e. where we pr prompts in and it's but so that I'm a photographer that's one of the most great photographers apparently in the world. I'm on a list that's just come up in court that Stability and Lay and B5 project used to, to uh, had a list of artists they wanted to copy the style of. And so it's very interesting that as I show you the picture of this roaring cat, there will be probably sys data set systems training on my images when my books come out. And that, in fact, you'll be able to create a, well, you can today, create an image in my style by just asking on a platform, please create a Tim Flack picture. But this is why I suppose in a way that I'm now, in a sense, having to really substantiate the evidence that what I'm doing is a real picture. And I think it's not unreasonable, given that one of the cats does look like someone's just photoshopped it black and gray. And, and that's, that's the crazy part of it. But my, my main interest is, is both to explore the questions around how imagery work. And I work with social scientists and neuroscientists to really explore um, the questions of how to connect people to evoke empathy, that we care enough, that we are like to take appropriate action to protect the natural world at a time when it's never before and more, been more important to connect people to nature and, and that our future absolutely depends on that. That's the end of my presentation. <laughs> I feel like I may have raced it through. And I'm very happy to take um, uh, questions or even go back into the presentation. Hello, can you all hear me? You can indeed, Tim, absolutely wonderful. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, as Tim was saying there, he's very, very happy to take questions. So please, if anybody has any questions, please type them into chat or unmute yourself and, and, and ask the question. Uh, Tim, I, I'm fascinated. I mean, I, I, I've seen your website, I've seen some of your images, but I didn't know about the amount of research that you put in. So um, how much time would, do you think you would divide between research and preparation and the actual making of the images? I think it's an interesting because I'm often asked about how do I choose the subjects for, for my work. And of course, in a way, I do see myself as a storyteller. And so I'm picking candidates that, that have stories that I want to explore. But having said that, obviously, I've got to find that balance between having something that is engaging <laughs> and a great story, because if sometimes you have to get a quiet picture that's not a great, interesting subject, but a really important story. And when I'm doing the cat book, for example, I can show you around. I mentioned the whiskers, for example. I'm sure not many of you on the phone realize that your cat, when you're waving your, 
your, your feather in front of its nose, it actually sees a blurred feather. It's actually using the whiskers and the vibration. Now, if I don't take an interest in the whole questions of cats, you know, going from, I don't know, demon, from deities of Basset in the Egyptian period and mummification to demonology, then I can't really know why I take a picture of the Tatum Lucidium, which is the reflective glow of the eyes, which is part of the demonology association. So in a way, the research is inextricably linked to why I picked the candidates. And even with the cat project, a domestic cat, I'm just looking around me and giving other examples, that, that it's actually the ideas come from the research because I want to tell stories about natural world. I see myself as not so much a, for, I see myself as trying to tell stories. So if you pick up a book on cats, one would hope you come out of it finding something that you weren't familiar with, maybe a detail in a way. I mean, photography is a great medium, isn't it? for catching or fragmenting a moment in time that your persistence yep. of vision cannot see. Yep. For example, you might see a micro detail. I've got the whole, I'll just grab something, you know. For example, you know, a nose of a cat that close, which will be about 24 inches, it's going to be a very different experience to you looking at your cat, like the nose in your cat, for example. Yeah. It's this idea of I'm really appreciating that photography can extend the experience, but the research is important because we're dealing with, I mean, scientists want to, in a sense, connect the big issues, particularly when we're talking about the natural world. I mean, we're at the moment, at a historical moment, where if we don't, in a sense, connect with big issues of what's happening in the natural world, humanity will not be here. And there are many collaborators working together to, in a sense, say, I mean, I'm in the field of communication, visual communication, but we all have to work together, social scientists, neuroscientists, uh, all the, to, to, as, as different actors, to in a sense figure out how we're going to move this forward. So my interest really is about how I can be a part of that collaboration. And I am working on a project in the National Science Foundation, um, this is the main science body in the US, US and we've just been given funding to work with 70,000 participants one of the biggest projects probably in history, and we'll analyze how signage and imagery works for the, for the main, those organizations work with, 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 with zoos and conservation mm -hmm. and so on. So we're breaking that down. I'm also working with another parallel project at Oxford University. And so I feel that I'm, you know, this is the idea that, that visual people should work with scientists is, is essential. If we don't in a sense break down this, we're going to continue on the same course. You can know something, but unless it touches the hearts and minds of people, people don't act. There's yeah. a difference between knowing and feeling and being touched profoundly. I think it was Roland Barthes talked about the punctum. I don't know if this is familiar to you, but it's a concept that something literally penetrates through you. It's not just something like the studio where you just take an interest. And so for us, I believe we have a responsibility to in a sense explore how to organize experiences. Um, Walter Benjamin, the philosopher, said the arts are the organization of experiences. And we as visual people need to work, I believe, with scientists to, in a sense, in a sense deliver those stories to you know, philanthropists, to par parliamentarians, to those that can actually change policy or funding. Because if we don't, I don't believe we have a future. So it's a very long answer, but I'm quite passionate about it. I, I, that's, that comes across very, very clearly that your, your passion is absolutely wonderful. And thank you very much for sharing it. There are a few other questions that have come in. Uh, Jill is wondering, do you take photos of animals in their original environment? And uh, allied with that, Jana is wondering, uh, which do you prefer the most doing that in the original environment or in captivity? Well, there's a reason for why. So my book in danger was informed by work by social scientists that had shown and proved evidence that actually images of wildlife photography traditionally were less effective in creating social change. And in fact, more recently, the paper I published uh, with social scientists that I then built on um, showed very strong evidence that if you really want to create change, you have to make it personal. And actually, there's a type of what they call critical anthropomorphism. So her question was actually, what do I enjoy working in the natural habitat 
or in the studio. I, I obviously enjoy meeting people and being out um, in, you know, amongst things, but I also feel the responsibility to see how I can powerfully communicate the stories. So there's two sides to this. I want to be effective. I'm not really there for the sake of saying I've just done the most difficult shot in the savannah. You know, I'm actually more interested in how I can deliver something that then ends up in a museum that makes you know people consider their, that story. And I think the danger is that the environmental movement invested ever since the, we call it the blue marble of the kind of, when the first space um, images were brought back, this idea that we're a fragile earth that mm -hmm. shed off the environmental movement. There was such investment in romanticizing the natural world and it was shown to be ineffective. And now we have evidence, which was part of the research I was involved with, which is overwhelming evidence that that's not necessarily the most powerful way to get, get that initial attention grabbing moment, that we need to actually use something that is relatable to our world. I can relate that further. I'm sure, are you familiar with things like Nick Ute's shot from, from Vietnam War? Yes, of course. Yeah. So why yeah. is that shot to change the policy back in America and the rest of the world? Because it was relatable. If you take the more recent image of the Turkish child that was that died in, and washed up. I think it was a three-year-old child on the Turkish border the Syrian, during the Syrian refugee crisis. It changed policy with Merkel, with our Prime Minister Cameron at the time, the Prime Minister of Canada, overnight, one picture. And that picture had a little detail on, it was a child's feet hanging down, held by a power, power military policeman. And there were some Velcro shoes, one unattached, and every parent can relate to their child and that Velcro shoes. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the child washed up in the water dead, but actually the child that was the image that was relatable, that bridged that sense of otherness to sameness. And it's the relatability of bringing something from one world into our world. And we have to do that with the natural world. You know, in a way, one of the most successful campaigns done by Chris Jordan was of uh, albatrosses taking on an island called the atolls, thousands of miles away from human habitation, where they would, the mothers were feeding chicks the plastics. And there's a picture showing the carcass of these um, birds with all the plastics. And the plastics is like the plastic you find in your fridge, you know, the bottle top. And mm -hmm. suddenly it becomes relatable. That was one of the most powerful effect conservation uh, projects was used by many of the major organizations, including the IUCN and others. And so understanding how images have to, in a sense, bridge that well, is understanding how they have to be personal, they have to be relatable. And for a long time, there's been a misunderstanding. I'm not suggesting wildlife photography is not relevant, it can tell the story of the habitat, but we need attention grabbers that connect us and bring us into that world. Okay, um, a few more questions have come in, and, and these are slightly more from a technical point of view. So, so Helen is saying, thank you very much, by the way, and some stunning images. And she's wondering, how difficult is it to keep the animals and the birds calm while you are photographing them? And then secondly, how much post-processing do you do on the images? Or are they just, as we see them, are they straight from the camera? Yeah, I think there, there, there's several questions there, because, um... The, the the calmness of the animals. So I, I think if you know my work, you'll see they don't look quite as stressed and whatever, because I do go, you saw the behind scenes of the aviary I built for the captive birds. So these are captive bred birds. But understanding behavior and understanding how to introduce animals to space, how not to pressurize them is, is, is very central. So I have a studio with controlled temperature, I will often bring even a cat, domestic cat, let it sniff around and spend a bit of time discovering the studio. But with a wild animal, understanding behind the context of that bird, whether it's been imprinted to humans, whether it's you know, been sensitive to those things. So some of the images I didn't do in the studio, although they looked like a studio shot, because if I'd brought a light into the situation, it would have been stressful. So in a way, being interested in animal behavior is part of what is a central part of what I do. Um, and, and, and that is, um, and then there's a second part of that question, which is about the retouching. So 
I tend to work with tonal changes, but not a lot of kind of placing things together. And that might sound surprising because my work may seem almost unreal. I would say that when you start looking at questions about how to guide the eye in compositional ways, I'm sure when you look at more closely at, I don't know, so for example, um, some of the key masters of photography, you'll see that they understand how to change edges. Um, and and it, it, you can actually change the way edges come together. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the corn sweet illusion, an example of where you get a gradation and one gradation meets the other, and it literally changes the whole value of one side, even though it's not dark or lighter. So understanding how edges work is linked to the perceptual system and the way the center surround cells work. So I'm saying that I do use Photoshop, is obviously the question. I, I do change edges, although they're minimal in one way, they're, they're, they make a huge difference. So I can take an edge and switch the eye from looking at that edge. Mm -hmm. understanding. I also say how the eye can move through from one direction and be more emotionally charged. For example, when I'm looking at a human face, as all of you will do the same, you naturally go predominantly to one side of the face. Your first fixation point, 75% to camera left. And that actually influences, that's why when you saw the, the dog, it looked symmetrical. When I flipped it, it didn't look symmetrical because you were constructing and predicting what the other side looked like. And so I will use these devices in constructing my pictures and will change edges to switch off the eye from seeing certain areas. So when we see, an, a, see the world, believe it or not, we only see the area of your thumb, the back of your thumb, literally 4.3 to 5 points a second. So how can I see this whole world? We construct it. We now know that only about 20% of sensory signals come in and about 80% go out. We, they're called perceptual priors. They're ways we map the world. They explain why photography works at all. If we didn't have a dominance of inside out, we wouldn't even say pictures as, as, as illusionistic. They would just be flat bits of tone on paper. And this is very fundamental. Those big shifts in understanding in areas like people like Andy Clark and um, other people like Margaret Livingston that looked at the science of the way the sen senses and the eye work is that we actually take a very abstracted, like a JPEG of the world, and it's the evolutionary reason for us to survive is that we have to take a quick snapshot before we get eaten by the Sega toothed tiger. You'd have to be in, in California half of 10,000 years ago to get eaten by a Sega toothed tiger, but a smilodon that's called. Cool. Um, but the point being, that you wouldn't get your lunch either. You need, um, it's a bit like me sending you a few picta, picta, um, um, sorry, not, not, not gigabyte, terabyte, but pictobytes to your computer, it, it would crash. So it's interesting when you start looking with a new perspective on perception, because it opens up whole understanding of how images can work. So when we look, take a picture, and we encourage the person to look to the left hand side of the picture, um, that area will become more emotionally charged. So when we look at the human face, we go to one side and then we map the rest in. We do that with every form. When you then take edges into account and then you go into others, you can literally transform the experience. So the original question, Paul, that you presented to me, or the second part, was do I use Photoshop? I don't do more than make small tonal changes, but they can profoundly change the experience for the viewer. Okay, yeah. And it's interesting because as part of your answer leads into the next question, which I think you've partially answered anyway. So Becky is wondering, uh, she'd love to hear more about how you know where people look in an image. Uh, and are there particular things that you're looking for when you take the image in order to draw the eye uh, in the viewer's eye into the image. I think yeah. you've partially answered all that. You actually really have mainly answered that one there with what you just said. <laughs> but I will go a bit further. So um, Picasso said, I don't seek, I find. And one of the things that we do is we see things that reveal themselves and they're usually much more interesting than our limited logic come up with. And then from that, you have to work back to in a sense, allow that experience of what you found interesting for someone else to experience. 
And then this is where the technology comes in, that you can use tools and, um, and, and by doing that, you can actually navigate where the eye moves. But it's not just an area, sometimes you have an area you think, well, that's a bit dodgy, that's boring in a picture. But what you've got to do is make sure that you truly get what it is that's interesting and then figure out a strategy to deliver that to other people in terms of their experience. Because mm -hmm. it's easy to see something and forget that other people don't see that. Because actually their eyes whizzed off by that bright object in the right hand corner of the print. Mm -hmm. Or something has a meaning to someone else it didn't have to the person who took the picture. So the real challenge is to be interested in how people transform something into meaning. And I think that this makes you a, rather than becoming therapy, it becomes communication. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've come to the end of the questions. There were lots of other comments uh, in the chat, but basically everybody is saying, what a wonderful presentation uh, we have experienced here today from you. Uh, some absolutely great images uh, and, and some stunning images. Uh, I think people have been uh, really impressed with your work, Tim, and uh, we are very, very grateful that you're able to join us today and share all of that with us. So thank you very, very much. Paul, well, thank you. It was a pleasure to do that. It's certainly the first time I've ever given a talk to five continents. <laughs> so thank you. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I, I think we have come to the end. Uh, I, I know Ricardo is still here. I don't know whether there's anything else Ricardo or JR would like to say. Uh, whilst they think about that, just to let everybody else know, uh, it's very interesting because today's presentation is going to uh, lead very much into our next presentation, which is going to be on the 23rd of February. And that's by an Italian photographer called Marco Gaiotti. And it's called Photography in Shrinking Natural Habitats. So, so unlike Tim, Marco takes his photographs out in the environment where these wild animals live. And he gave us a presentation right at the very beginning of the Academy in 2020, and he's coming back again to join us. Uh, and I know it's going to be as good as the one that we saw today from Tim. So we'll be sending information out to everybody about that uh, in the next few weeks. Okay, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Thank, Thank you, you. Dave. We'll see you soon. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Well done. Well done for the. Thank you very image. much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Tim. For the thought behind the images, actually, it's really nice. Thank you. It's a pleasure to share this with you. And uh, yeah. Fascinating. The, the thought behind how you do the pictures is amazing. <laughs> well, thank you. No, it's an honor to be sharing this with you. And as I said, I've just shared a lot of images that no one's seen. I mean, literally no one outside the studio because um, I'm literally posting stuff that we shot in the last weeks. Well, I've never seen cats like that. And <laughs> There's a special <laughs> preview. <laughs> and that, and that, 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 that was marvelous. We really, really did enjoy it. Uh, and we're grateful for the special preview, Tim. No, no, it's my, my, my honor. It's nice to share. I'm excited about the work I'm doing and I, it's great to share it. So thank you again. I wish you a very wonderful 2024 and uh, I feel honored to be the first speaker of the, of the new year. So, thank you very much. And, and I really you. wish you the same and, and hopefully it'll be a successful 2024. By the way, when, when do you plan to publish the cat book? It won't be till the fall of 25. Ah, um, okay. Partly because it takes about, I've got a year shooting, and then there's a lot of faffing of getting translations and things printed and shipped around. So I think it will probably get to the States, for example, it's with Abrahams, um, probably around October uh, 2025, yes. Okay. I it's shall have to keep an eye out of the bookshop. <laughs> Well, thank you. And it will be, I, I know it will be in German, I believe quite a few other languages. Okay. Well, I'll be searching for the English edition anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you again. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank